It's time for This Week in Research Papers. That's right, welcome to Twerp. And now here's your resident twerp, the study finds guy, Jeff Allen. Well, strap yourself in for another week in Research Papers. That time of week that we go over everything you need to know about all things study finds. In our top 10 today, we'll talk about serial killer whales. Yes, you heard me correctly. Also, a genetic trigger that may cure baldness and robot noses that can smell diseases. But first, let's get started with some happy news. <laughs> Number 10, a nuclear war between world powers would trigger a little ice age. <laughs> well, there's some fun news. <laughs> Have a nice day. Experts from Louisiana State University say that firestorms resulting from the man-made Armageddon would release ash and smoke into the upper atmosphere that would block out the sun, resulting in crop failure around the world. Wow, well, LSU, way to bring down the room. I remember when I was a kid, we used to have to hide under the desks. Like, what is that going to do? Word has it that in the first month following a catastrophic nuclear fart from some asshole world leader, the average global temperatures would plunge by about 13 degrees Fahrenheit, more than during the most recent ice age. That event ended 11,700 years ago, killing off creatures like the woolly mammoth. Overall, the last ice age lasted more than 100,000 years, making the world about 10 degrees Fahrenheit colder than it is today. I saw the movie Ice Age. It felt like it was longer than 100,000 years, especially the sequels. I mean, I love Ray Romano, but how many times can we do the same story? Where was I? Oh, they say it doesn't matter who's bombing who, the effect would be worldwide, so that would suck. Don't screw it up, world. All right, enough of that. It's depressing. Number nine. Traditional Chinese medicine actually proves more effective than standard drugs in children with recurrent respiratory tract infections, or RRTIs, according to a new study. A group of Chinese researchers found that one particular formula, Yupinfang, or YPF, works on the kiddos dealing with the RRTIs. Researchers analyzed 351 children between the ages of 2 and 6 with these recurrent respiratory tract infections and divided them into three groups. The first group received the YPF, the second group took pedetamod, that's a conventional allopathic drug to treat respiratory infections, and the third group received a placebo or nothing. <laughs> After one year, 73% of children in the YPF group had their RRTIs return to a normal standard, while only 67% of the pedidimod group had the same improvement, and only 39% of the placebo group returned to normal. Study authors say that traditional Chinese medicines can be as effective and safe as allopathic drugs, even though we may not fully understand the biological mechanisms underlying their effects. On to number eight. Most drivers think their old car is more eco-friendly than buying an electric vehicle or EV, and that's how hip people like me say electric vehicles, you know, EV. In fact, in a survey of 2,000 people, 52% believe older cars are more sustainable since they use fewer resources than building new cars. <laughs> and between what it takes to build the batteries and generate the electricity, it's no wonder <laughs> there are questions out there. 82% of younger drivers believe electric cars are the future, and 72% between 18 and 40 would consider purchasing one. In comparison, only 28% of older drivers, that's, you know, the get off my lawn crowd, <laughs> would consider ever purchasing an electric vehicle, even though 51% still see EVs as the future. People in the survey also say EVs have a higher bar to meet before they'll consider buying one. So what's the higher bar? I thought you would never ask. 37% say longer range, 34% say it should cost the same as a gas-powered vehicle, and 30% want to see improved safety. Now, when they can beam the electricity direct to my car from space, I'm in. Now get off my lawn. On to number seven. More happy news here. Overdosing on vitamin D supplements is a real possibility and can cause severe illness. It's called hypervitamintosis D, a condition caused by too much vitamin D, and it's on the rise. Researchers in England say it can lead to a wide range of serious health issues. People get vitamin D from sunlight and certain foods or supplements. Now talk to your doctor if you have questions. I am not one of those. I have to keep reminding you of that. 
Officials say women, children, and people with weakened immune systems are most likely to develop this condition. Recently, a middle-aged man in the old country was taken to the hospital complaining of vomiting, nausea, chest pain, leg cramps, ringing in his ears, a dry mouth, thirst, diarrhea, and weight loss. The man had been taking more than 20 over-the-counter vitamin D supplements every day, or 50,000 milligrams. That's more than 80 times the recommended amount. He also had very high levels of calcium and slightly raised levels of magnesium. The man stayed in the hospital for eight days and received fluids to flush out his system. He was also given drugs which are normally used to strengthen bones and lower levels of calcium in his blood. Less is more, folks. On to number six. Hawks prioritize a smooth landing over speed and energy. That's kind of how I want my airplane pilot to do it too. Safety first, folks. And that's what the Hawks do, according to researchers from the University of Oxford. The study finds Hawks purposely control their flight to ensure the safest landing conditions possible when perching, even if it makes the entire process longer and means spending more energy. <laughs> I always tell the kids that. Do you want it done right or do you want it done fast? Researchers add that better understanding of how different birds land may assist the development of small aircraft with the capacity to perch like birds in the future. <laughs> well, I don't think we're there yet with the airlines, but runways could be shorter. <laughs> when an airplane lands on a runway, it has plenty of room to slow down. Birds, on the other hand, must break much more abruptly before landing on the perch. This is quite a feat of physics, they say. Slowing to a safe speed while flying can lead to a stall and a subsequent sudden loss of control, and nobody needs that, not even the birds. Using motion capture technology, researchers observed that the hawks were following a flight path that slowed them to a safe speed while simultaneously minimizing distance from the perch at which they stall. To minimize stalling, the hawks dive downward while flapping and spreading their wings to a gliding posture while swooping up to the perch. As far as learning how to, quote, Fly like a bird, artificial intelligence takes hundreds of hours to produce an answer to the perching problem. Somehow, hawks come up with the optimal perching solution after just a few flights. <laughs> Take that, you stupid computer. Okay, number five. Scientists are urging wildlife officials to reintroduce wolves to local landscapes. <laughs> I love wolves, but I think they want to eat me. Let's see what this says. Wolves often get a bad reputation as predators who gobble up local livestock and threaten people living nearby. Well, on the other hand, many environmental activists argue that wolves and other predators help to restore the order in local ecosystems. Well, who's right? <laughs> now, a new study says wildlife officials should reintroduce wolves to local landscapes and that it would probably not hurt or help things for that matter. So you're not helping, folks. <laughs> But conservationists would like to see it happen anyway. Are wolves bad? Well, there are issues with livestock. Researchers say there are ways to keep them safe if you spend a little more money on security. Are they good? Well, as far as keeping wildlife in check, scientists say that when wolves and other predators are around, deer and other herbivores simply wait to graze when they're off resting. So wolves wouldn't do much to help control soaring wildlife populations. Still not helping. <laughs> Researchers also say that reintroducing wolves to Yellowstone National Park did not miraculously save the entire ecosystem as thought, but it didn't hurt it either. Scientists say other factors including hunters, grizzly bears, mountain lions, bison, beaver, rainfall patterns, climate, and the quality and quantity of vegetation appear to have also helped Yellowstone. Still not helping, folks. We've got a decision to make here. Study authors conclude, quote, as long as people learn to live with and tolerate the new well, really old neighbors, a careful but not fully conflict-free existence appears possible. <laughs> Basically, the idea here is that they're not the villains or the heroes, and they should be allowed to flourish, is what they're saying. Here we are at number four. Humpback whales teach each other songs from different regions and cultures. Oh, so like drinking songs from the old country, right? Oh, a whale song. So, oh, let's listen, shall we? Oh, so like in Star Trek IV, when Kirk had to go rescue a whale from the 1980s to tell a space probe what to do with itself when it was destroying the Earth? I remember that. Okay. Researchers from the University of Queensland say humpback whales teach each other songs as they travel along Australia's coast. The study discovered that New Caledonian humpback whales learn new songs 
by other whales coming from Australia's east coast. Incredibly, researchers say the New Caledonian humpbacks are great students, learning the new songs with remarkable accuracy. <laughs> but it's that awesome Australian accent that really makes it sound great, I bet. <laughs> During their research, Dr. Jenny Allen from UQ's School of Veterinary Science said, quote, each year we observe them, they sing a different song. So it means humpback whales can learn an entire song pattern from another population very quickly even if it's complex or difficult. Alan says it's rare for this degree of cultural exchange to be found on such a large scale in non-human species. Humpback whales were recently removed from the endangered species list. Well, that's obviously a positive sign. Study authors caution that humpback whale populations are still very vulnerable. So keep Captain Kirk on standby just in case. I love this one. Number three. Robot noses could soon detect undiagnosed diseases by smelling someone's breath. <laughs> I can see it now, uh, sir. Uh, the nose robot says you smell like you had a poop sandwich with poop on it. <laughs> I kid. An international team is working on new techniques which analyze the chemical compounds in a person's breath, sweat, and tears, adding that these chemicals serve as fingerprints for thousands of diseases. Scientists call this concept volatilomics and note that it's still several steps away from working in a lab to becoming a commercially available product for doctors and consumers. How does this work, you ask? Well, it's a great question. When you smell, I mean, not when you smell, but when you're smelling. Yeah. <laughs> when you smell, your nose is encountering volatile organic compounds or VOCs. These chemicals have a low boiling point and evaporate very easily, which is why they're called volatile. See, there's a reason for the name. Every organism actually releases VOCs, whether or not they know it. <laughs> I just blame the dog. They do this for different reasons, one of which is in response to biological changes such as getting sick. Now, nanomaterial sensors like the e-nose can accurately spot VOC fingerprints coming from food Beverages, pollution, and people. And the dog, right? <laughs> Researchers say the field of study is young. They have cataloged many of the VOCs that come from bodily sources, and they now plan to review and improve upon things like sensor structures and data processing methods before the tech can become a usable reality. On to number two. This one is a bit scary. A serial killer whale duo is slaughtering great white sharks in their own hunting grounds. What would the fawns say? <laughs> Jump the shark, don't eat him. <laughs> I know, some of you get that. Look it up. A pair of orcas, or killer whales, may be the new Bonnie and Clyde of the sea. According to a new study, despite great white sharks being the dominant species off the Gansby South African coast for years, new tracking data and shark sightings reveal that these famous predators are now avoiding the area completely. Researchers say the obvious reason is they're scared of becoming prey for the orca. Since 2017, eight great white sharks have washed up on shore after a deadly orca attack. Seven of the sharks had their livers ripped out. Some of these predators had their hearts eaten as well. Oh my. Study authors say the wounds are clearly the work of the same pair of killer whales now living in the area, and the team says their body count is probably higher because all of the dead sharks don't wash up on land. While some whale species strictly feed on small shrimp, orcas are more than capable of attacking large predators like sharks. Basically, scientists say that as the ecosystem changes along with the food sources available, perhaps the diet of the local sea critters change as well based on what's available. And now, wake the neighbors, you've been waiting for it, and here it is, number one. A hair growth genetic trigger has been discovered that may cure baldness. Well, get my car keys and call Steve Harvey. Scientists have discovered the molecular signal which triggers potent hair growth in both men and women. The discovery of this signaling molecule, SCUBE3, you know what, I'm just going to call it SCUBE3, just going forward. It may finally put an end to baldness and hair loss conditions such as alopecia. Researchers from the University of California, Irvine say, quote, We revealed that the S cube 3 signaling molecule, which dermal papilla cells produce naturally, is the messenger used to tell the neighboring hair stem cells to start dividing, which heralds the onset of new hair growth. The study reveals that activating S cube 3 by dermal papilla cells is a key step in growing hair 
for both mice and people. In conditions like alopecia, dermal papilla cells don't function properly. This reduces the amount of normally abundant activating molecules available. Tests in the mice prove that injecting SQ3 works to spark new hair growth. More research is needed, but the scientists are confident that they are on the right track. Well, that puts another twerp update in the bag for this week. And if you're a balding whale who likes wolves, this was a huge coincidence for you. This has been This Week in Research Papers. You can check out more info on this and other studies by clicking in the link in the description below and head over to studyfinds.com. 